welcome back to the course on data compression with deep probabilistic models. This video marks a pivotal point in the course. So far, we've covered mostly topics from source coding and from information theory. But starting with this video, we'll also think about probabilistic machine learning methods. This video will cover the basics of the connection between source coding and probability theory. And I'm aware that these basics may be a repetition for some of the viewers. But in subsequent videos, we will then build upon these basics and we will go back and forth between source coding theory and probabilistic machine learning because we will see that these two sides of the coin, they really interact in intricate ways. So let's jump in. In order to understand how source coding and probabilistic machine learning play together, let's remind ourselves about the bigger picture. So in one of the first uh, lectures, we looked at this general setup for communication over a noisy channel where we have a sender and a receiver and the sender has some data source that's not under our control. The data source generates a message and we want to send that message over a noisy channel so that the receiver can reconstruct that message. And we saw that we have to encode and decode the message. And then I told you, and we will show this in a later uh, part of the lecture of the course, that we can always split the encoder, at least in theory, into two parts, one that's called source coding and one that's called channel coding. And uh, the name for these two parts reflect that, for example, the channel coding part only needs to know properties about the noisy channel. So it can completely ignore any properties of the data source. And then the source coding part um, can assume that, if it can assume that channel coding is already done optimal, then it can assume that all properties of the noisy channel are already taken care of and the source coding part itself only has to know properties of the data source. And then when we looked at these symbol codes, we already saw that the properties that we need to know about the data source um, are encoded in a probabilistic model. So we need a probabilistic model um, of the data source. So for example, in the symbol codes, we had to look at the probabilities of symbols so that we can then construct an optimal symbol code using a Huffman tree. And kind of in, on a higher level, what that means is the idea of source coding is basically you have a probabilistic model that makes some predictions of what's going to come next. These predictions aren't necessarily deterministic. They can still have some uncertainty, but they're still predictions. And then the idea is you don't, pre don't transmit what you can predict. So that's, I think, a good kind of slogan to keep in your mind when you think about source coding. It's don't transmit what you can predict. So if you can predict that the next, uh, for example, letter in your natural language model is very likely going to be an E, then uh, the probability of the next letter being an E is very high, which means that the information content of that letter being E will be very low. So you will need very few bits to transmit that next letter. Now, when I say we need a probabilistic model of the data source, I mean, that model could be uh, good or bad. And actually the models that we've looked at so far are actually quite very simplistic. So we kind of assume that if we make these models better, if we can model the data source better, then we would assume that we get better compression performance. So qualitatively, we kind of have this idea that, you know, qualitatively, we would assume that better models, better probabilistic models would lead to um, better compression performance. And I think that Kind of qualitatively this should be clear but uh, the first goal of today of this video is that we want to make this statement quantifiable so that we want to 
quantify this statement. And that leads us to our first topic for this video that's quantifying Uh, the effect of a modeling error. So what happens if the probabilistic model is not correct? And with quantifying, I mean, I really want to measure how many bits do we lose by having a, from having a non incorrect model. And uh, the quantity that will turn out to be relevant here is called the so-called callback Leibler divergence. So the callback, this is a B, Leibler divergence. That's our first topic for this video. So in order to quantify the modeling error, um, let's consider actually a very general lossless compression setup. So consider the um, general, general with one L, lossless compression setup. Uh, what I mean with that is we're no longer restricted to symbol code, so we no longer um, restrict ourselves um, to the um, to the goal that every symbol has to be mapped to an integer number of bits. We've talked a lot about symbol codes in the previous videos. Um, but we will actually be able, it, although we kind of released this constraint, now we will actually see that we will be able to use a lot what we've learned about symbol codes now also in this more general setup. And so we have a general lossless compression setup. So that means we have some data source and that now generates some messages going to call them X again. Um, and these messages have some, it generates these messages with some probabilities. We don't know what this data source um, generates. If we knew, then we wouldn't have to transmit the data at all. And I'm going to call the probability now P data because I want to be explicit that it's the probability of the data source. Now also again, to be explicit, this is now a probability distribution of over entire messages, entire. So um, it's not just over symbols. So, so far we've always looked about probabilities of symbols, but now we're really thinking about the probability of an entire message. So not just single symbols. And then we're interested in, since we're doing compression, we're obviously interested in what I will call the bit rate. So I'm going to define um, the bit rate um, R of a message X. And that's just as you would expect, um, kind of the um, total number of bits. Number of uh, bits. Uh, in the compressed representation of X in compressed representation of X for some given com lossless compression method. So we assume that we have some given lossless compression method. We want to um, see how well it performs. So we can just apply it to some message and then count how many bits it spits out for a given lossless compression method. 
So this bitrate is kind of similar to um, the code word length that we had in symbol codes, but now I'm really interested in the bitrate of the entire message, not just of a symbol, single symbol in that message. Um, and in many cases, what we're interested in is um, the expected bitrate. If we are interested in building a compression method that minimizes the expected bitrate. So the optimal, so, and we're kind of interested in what can be the, what is the lower bound, the theoretical lower bound, um, so the lowest theoretically possible. expected bitrate. That's not necessarily always the best metric to look at. Sometimes you may want to be interested in giving a, a general upper bound on all messages that you could encounter. But for many cases, you are interested in the expected bitrate. Now, what is that optimal expected bitrate? Well, um, it's the expectation of x coming from the data source. I'm going to denote this as x sampled from p data. Then of the bitrate of some, I'm going to call this r opt, because I'm assuming now we have an optimal lossless compression method. Now, what can we say about this optimal bitrate? Well, we haven't really discussed this so far because we've only kind of been um, considering symbol codes, but we can actually use what we've learned about symbol codes because we can say, you know, um, at least in theory, you could construct a symbol code where you consider um, the whole set of um, possible messages so basically you're considering the entire message as a single symbol. And that means that the entire set of um, possible messages that your data source could generate, um, you can consider that as an alphabet. Which will probably be a very giant alphabet. If you think about image compression, then you have like your whole alphabet is just the all possible images that you could possibly have. Um, so this is not really a practical symbol code. You would have to, uh, to construct an enormous uh, code book, but uh, at least it means you can apply all the theory that we've learned about symbol codes. And then the theory tells you that, so right in this setup kind of X, the message X, is now a symbol, is a single symbol from this kind of entire, from this giant alphabet. And then we know that um, the expected code word length, which is the expected number of bits for that symbol, that that is in the optimal case, essentially that is um, the entropy of p data plus some epsilon. So we get the same result now also here. So then the expected bitrate in this other implement uh, interpretation is now the um, entropy of um, the data distribution. Uh, plus some epsilon, where we learned that this epsilon is um, less than one bit. And in symbol codes, we kind of uh, looked at this overhead quite a bit, and we kind of compared it between, for example, Shannon coding and Huffman coding, and we saw that it really makes a difference for symbol codes, and that is because for symbol codes, we would here have the entropy per symbol, and that entropy per symbol could be very low. So even an overhead of less than one bit could make a difference. But now that we're looking at kind of the bitrate of an entire message, which could be for an image, something on the order of megabytes, 
um, one bit is really irrelevant. So this uh, can now be really um, uh, typically be neglected. Irrelevant, typically irrelevant. Right, so this is an important relation to keep in mind um, that is just follows from what we've learned about symbol codes, just kind of reinterpreted uh, symbol codes in a different way, kind of tells us that there exists um, an optimal compression method that essentially um, in expectation leads, uh, can compress data to its entropy number of bits. And I'm actually, in what follows, I'm actually going to leave out this epsilon part because it is so small. Now, of course, we've also kind of seen that these symbol codes would not really be practical, but we will learn in later uh, videos that uh, there are so-called stream codes where you can in many situations actually construct a lossless compression method that reaches this lower bound very closely, that comes very close to this lower bound and that can be implemented efficiently. Another thing that we learned when we looked at simple codes and that directly kind of can now general, generalizes to this kind of more um, realistic setup is that um, as a reminder, um, this is only a statement about the expected bit rate, the optimal value for the expected bit rate. But we also saw when we derived this for symbol codes that in order to reach this optimal bound, we actually have to uh, satisfy this equation, not only in expectation, but actually for every value. So what do I mean with that? Um, well, I mean, as you remember this entropy, is defined as the expectation over P data of the information content. And I typically mean the log with base two when I just write log. So what we saw that if you actually want to reach, if you want to build a lossless compression method that reaches this lower bound on the expected bit rate, then the only way to do this is actually if you satisfy this equation for every, um, every message that you can have. So to reach this um, optimal expected bit rate, a compression mechanism, a compression and that's what we saw when we derived kind of this lower bound by taking the derivatives um, of the this um, um, optimization problem over uh, real numbers we saw that uh, you have to be close to this lower bound and then there's only a small rounding error on top of that which in our setup now is kind of neg negligible. So in order to reach this optimal expected bit rate, a compression method has to satisfy this relation that our opt of x equals, now I'm not, I'm not talking about the expectation value, I'm talking about every individual uh, bit rate for every individual message has to actually be um, the negative log, so the information content um, of the probability of that symbol. And of course, again, plus some small epsilon. So again, this is also an important relation to remember if you, I'm not saying that, so you can actually beat and we saw this in the problem sets, you can actually beat um, the, this bit rate for individual symbols. But if you do that, then you no longer have an optimal, um, then you can no longer reach this optimal bit rate in expectation. So if you have this optimal bit rate in expectation, then you also have this relation for every data point. So for every, um, for every message. <clears throat> 
x. That is actually should also be highlighted. And now we want to look at you know, how does this picture change if you actually don't know p data. That's what we what I mean with what is the modeling error. So how do, much does it cost if we don't know if you have a wrong model of the data. So we now want to distinguish. So we want to rem again remind ourselves about the problem here that uh, in practice we don't know the data distribution. In practice. Uh, we don't, so we have some data sources, could be maybe a camera, and if you just look at a camera, I bet you won't be able to write down a probability distribution over all images that it can produce. You don't know p data. So we have to distinguish two probability distributions. One is p data, which we just looked at, which is um, the true probability distribution of the data source, of data coming from the data source. Of and then we have to distinguish that from the what we use in order to construct a compression method which is just a model of the data source and in general that model will not be perfect. So again the data the true probability distribution is something that we don't know but in many cases we will uh, have some some samples from the data distribution. So again, if you think about image compression, we may have some directory of images um, that have been taken with the same camera or with a similar camera. So, um, but uh, we may have samples. So a set of samples from PData. And what that means is, um, well, since we don't know this probability distribution, we cannot evaluate it anywhere. So we cannot actually calculate what is the information content of any image or any, any message that we get from that data source. But since we have a data set, we can, what we can do is we can e evaluate what I am going to call empirical averages. So we can evaluate empirical averages so we can take these samples then for each sample calculate um, the bitrate that's something we can do if you have some compression method so we can just apply the compression method to all these samples then count how many bits we get and then um, average them over these samples and that would be an empirical average and that will help us to estimate uh, true expectation values. So if you allow me to hide this for just a second, so here we were looking at expectation value of the bitrate under the data distribution, we cannot evaluate this expectation value because we cannot, uh, for that we need to know, we would have to know the probability under the data distribution of every single message. And we don't know that, but we can draw some samples from our data set and then average the bitrate and then that gives us an estimate of the left hand side. The reason why I'm being so explicit here is because I want to highlight these words, empirical averages and estimate um, the true expectation values that those are kind of words that will appear a lot in the machine learning context. And then on the other hand, if you look at the model distribution, this is, um, for now, we're going to make some very simplifying assumptions for now. We're going to assume that we can explicitly evaluate this. Assume 
we can explicitly evaluate p model of x for all x. We will later see some scenarios where we can't even do that, um, where even that has to be that model distribution has to be estimated in some way, but for now, for simplicity, we're going to assume that we can always evaluate this. So when we now build a compression method, um, we can only make it optimal to this p model probability. So the compression method will now be optimal to this probability. So its bitrate for every data point will be the up to some small rounding error will be the information content, content under the model distribution, not under the data distribution. So an optimal code will therefore have, so an optimal lossless compression code um, will have, will now be optimal with respect to p model and that will therefore have the bitrate r of x being the information content under of that message under the model distribution so now we may be again be interested in so how should we what is the kind of the expected bitrate that we get out if you have some model that might be a bit wrong well the expected bitrate and this will kind of build the bridge to machine learning because you will now see a quantity that will appear often in machine learning um, so we have to take the expectation over the messages of this bitrate r of x sorry yeah r of x which is exactly this r but now importantly when we are interested in the expected bitrate we are not interested in the expectation under Mod, the model distribution because at the end this model is just something that we need to build as a proxy to the data distribution which we don't have but what we're really interested in is when once we have this compression method and we apply it in the wild and we get new samples from the true data distribution what is the expected bit rate that we get from that so here we have to take the expectation under the data distribution so in total we get the expectation of x from the data distribution but then the information content under the model distribution and if you've trained some machine learning models before then this term will become will look familiar to you because this is nothing else but the so-called cross entropy between the data distribution and the model distribution which is in many machine learning models kind of the loss function that you minimize anyway so this is again an important relation if you now look at how many bits does it cost to compress some data with some kind of not quite correct model well it's really the cross entropy so And that's really great because um, now you can train a machine learning model that you want to maybe use for compression. And the nice thing about it is you don't even have to build a compression code for it. So you can separate the task of training the machine learning model from the task of compression because um, you don't need to build a compression method in order to 
see how many bits you need in, app, in, in expectation to, to compress some data under the model, you can just evaluate or estimate the cross entropy. And the way to estimate is to just, you know, calculate the log probability of your data points under the model distribution. We assume that we can calculate that and then average that over the empirical samples from the data set that we assume to have, which we would call a training set in machine learning. So you've now seen that the loss function that in many cases in machine learning that you minimize anyway can actually be motivated from a compression perspective because it actually is, many machine learning methods are actually minimizing the um, cross entry, so the expected bit rate that you would get out of that. So let me actually state that explicitly. So if you have now in your model some free parameters and you want to tune these free parameters, then the way to do this for compression is to minimize the cross entropy. We have to minimize the cross entropy P model over parameters, so for example, neural network rates of um, P model, because that's the only thing we can change. We cannot change the data distribution that's given. So this is the bit rate that you get. Now let me give this a name. Let me call this um, Actually, uh, let's just refer to it as cross entropy. Um, so this is the bit rate that we get. And we also know that the, um, this has to be, this cannot be uh, lower than the theoretical lower bound, which if you allow me to scroll up, we, uh, derive, we argued was uh, the actual entropy of the data. So with this lower bound and then this actual practical um, bit rate that we will get, we can now calculate the overhead. And that will allow us to quantify how much it costs if our model does not reflect uh, the data distribution, which it will never perfectly. So the overhead due to P model not being exactly the data distribution, which in practice it will never be, is called the kalbach liebler divergence. So it is um, often denoted as D sub, I'm going to denote it as this D sub KL. You will sometimes also just see it as KL of something. But then here the notation is uh, uh, fairly consistent in the literature that you first note the data distribution and then the model distribution separated by kind of a double bar. This is just the notation you will find in the literature. And the way this is usually pronounced is that you say this is the kalbach liebler divergence from the model distribution to the data distribution. So it's pronounced from right to left. And this is, so this is the actual bit rate that we get, which will be the cross entropy. Minus so this is the actual bit rate. Minus the theoretical lower bound. And then another way kind of to write it more explicitly, there are kind of several ways to write this. Um, one way that I think is worth keeping kind of in the front of your head is uh, that you can write this as the expectation under the data distribution. We always, in both of these terms, we're taking the expectation under the data distribution. The only way how they differ is what are we now taking 
the um, information content of, and you can then rewrite this as the log of the fraction between the data distribution p of x and the model distribution. And again, of course, we cannot actually calculate the p data of x. Um, so we cannot calculate this scale divergence in practice, um, but we um, will need it to um, derive some, some theoretical statements for this. So this is the Kalbeck-Liebler divergence, which is given both of these kind of definitions are, I think, important to remember. So since this is the actual bitrate minus the theoretical lower bound, we know kind of that the actual bitrate cannot be lower than the theoretical lower bound. So we know that the KL divergence cannot be negative. Um, but kind of to convince you about this in a more direct way, you will also show on problem uh, 3.1c on, on problem set number three, which is linked in the video description. Um, you will actually show this in a more um, a direct way. So you'll prove uh, that dkl for any two distributions p and q, so from q to p, is never negative. And this is called Gibbs theorem. So now that we know how much it costs to have a model that doesn't uh, precisely reflect um, your data, true data distribution, let's actually look at uh, the models that we've um, considered so far when we discuss symbol codes. So, so far, we've actually looked at very simplistic models, which will therefore be in, in general, and in, in most cases actually be very bad. So the models that we've looked so far um, were on messages where we assume that these messages are um, sequences of symbols from some alphabet. And we have assumed that these models are just um, a product of, where k is the length of the message, of uh, probabilities. I guess you need also a p of k here, um, kind of as a side remark. But the main part here was that um, it's just a product of the probabilities of all these symbols. And that's what's called, um, in, in statistics, these kinds of probabilistic models are called um, IID. So we have assumed that the symbols so this is the probability of a single symbol we've assumed that these are iid i i d which is short for independent and identically distributed. What does that mean? Well, um, identically is, these are kind of two restrictions that we have put on ourselves so far. So identically is easy to understand. So, and this is also kind of just a, a minor point here. So identically just means that we've so far kind of for every, sim every symbol in that sequence, we've used the same probability distribution, but that's actually something that we could easily drop. So um, this um, uh, could be easily dropped, easy to drop this constraint. Um, Or this restriction. Um, so we could just say that um, instead the p model 
should be um, of the message, should be um, again some probability of the length of the message times um, i equals 1 to k uh, probability p i, so a different probability for every symbol. And then here, this is the new part that this probability distribution of the symbols now depends on where you are, on the position where you are in the message. Um, and you will, if you go through the proofs, uh, you'll see that at least for prefix codes, everything will still work out. Prefix, and we've seen that prefix codes are really all we need. And the simple way to think about this is if you have a prefix code, you just have to kind of, for decoding, you just have to kind of look at the message and read off bits until you've read, read enough bits so that they match some of the, one of the code words in your code book. And then you chop these uh, bits off from your message. And that doesn't even need, that can be done in a greedy way. So it doesn't have to look forward at the next symbol, which will then be distributed with a different distribution, therefore use a different code book. So this is easy to um, drop this restriction. The only reason why I had this restriction to begin with is because I wanted to keep the notation simple and didn't want to have these eyes floating around everywhere. Um, but the more important restriction is this independence. So what that means is, so this is really the difficult part. Um, what that means is that, um, well, the technical term means that we are not able to model correlations. We haven't uh, been able to model correlations. Uh, between symbols. And of course, I haven't told you yet what correlations means. So if you haven't had a course on probability theory yet, so uh, correlations and kind of loosely speaking, you can think of that as if you know some of the symbols, does that tell you something about the other symbols? So for example, if you think about some English text, if you know that one of the symbols is a Q, then you will know that with high probability that the next symbol will uh, very likely be a U because in English text, Q is usually followed by U. Um, and that is a correlation. So the probability of the next symbol changes depending on how um, your previous, what your previous, what the value of the previous symbol was. Um, so that's a kind of a intuitive understanding of um, correlations. But this topic of modeling correlations is actually so important. So this will really um, haunt us through basically the rest of the course. So I will now introduce kind of in, an interlude where I recap some of the topics, some of the important topics of probability theory so that we can properly define what we mean with correlations and then also quantify how correlated uh, certain symbols or certain parts of your message are. Um, so I will now start with an interlude on probability theory and on random variables. I'm aware that these topics may be a repetition for some of the viewers. So if you're confident that you already know enough about probability theory, then please feel free to skip this interlude. And you can do this by jumping directly to the one hour and 51 minute mark. Just keep in your mind that one goal of this interlude on probability theory will also be to introduce the precise notation that I'm going to use throughout the rest of the course. So if you do skip this interlude and then later on in the course you find yourself being confused by some of the notation, then you may want to consider coming back to the interlude to understand exactly what the notation that I'm going to use will mean. So let's go ahead and start with an interlude on probability theory and what we are going to call random variables. So again, the goal through much of the rest of this course will be to efficiently 
model correlations between um, uh, parts of the message. And there are really two important words here. That is correlations, and we will learn what exactly this is, but also efficiently. So we will see that um, the theory, how you model correlations, that's really kind of completely understood in a sense, but um, it can become extremely expensive and prohibitively expensive if you want to do this in the most general way. So we are in the rest, really throughout the rest of the course, we were going to learn different techniques that allow us to kind of model the most important correlations in an efficient way. And we will then see that for each of these techniques, the, each of these techniques will only kind of work with, together with certain source coding algorithms. So here, probability theory and kind of probabilistic models and machine learning methods will go hand in hand with very specific um, source coding algorithms. And then correlations is, you know, what we learn in the next step. So in order to learn that, um, we at first have to kind of introduce um, and fix some notation and introduce some um, fundamental concepts from probability theory. So one way to uh, introduce probability theory that I find uh, kind of the most intuitive is really to construct it from the bottom up. So um, the way you do this is uh, through measure theory. So in this theory, um, you will have a sample space, what is called a sample space, and I should say this will not be kind of a full-fledged course on probability theory. If you have never heard anything about probability theory, I really encourage you to attend a course on this or to read uh, a book on this. Um, I will just introduce kind of the concepts that are most important in, uh, for this course in a very kind of pragmatic way. So um, we start here from what we call a sample space, typically denoted by capital omega which you can think of as an abstract, typically abstract could also be something you can really picture, but it's some space of um, states of the world. Now, this is obviously not really a mathematical definition. Mathematically, it's just a set, um, but I'm just giving you these um, intuitions so that you can uh, as a guidance of what you should think of when you see this omega, how you can then interpret it. And then we define a subset of the space we call an event. So an event E is a subspace of the sample space. And again, as kind of a guidance of how you should think about events is we say that an event E occurs, right? So something specific happens uh, that just means that the world is in a state, is in a state omega from this event, from this subset of the sample space. So the world is always in some state of this omega because it's the space of all states of the world. Maybe I should make this clear. All states of the world. Um, but it's not necessarily always in a state um, from the subset. So if it is in the state of the subset, then we say that event E occurs. And then once we have these events, then, then we can talk about the probability that an event occurs. And in order to talk about that, we introduce a probability measure. And the word measure here is really a technical term. So a probability measure, I will denote it by capital P, is a function from some set sigma, which I'll go to in a second, um, to the set, uh, sorry, the interval from zero to one. So real numbers that are in this interval zero to one. And this set um, sigma is called a sigma algebra. On, on the sample space omega. I'm not going to go into detail what a sigma algebra is, kind of in, in brief, it's just making sure it's a 
set of subsets set of subsets of omega but the set of subsets also um, satisfies some probabilities is some some properties which basically just make sure that everything that I'm going to say next um, is e even well defined so what am I going to say next so this probability distribution uh, measure p this has to have some properties in order to make it really a probability measure so first of all the probability these are kind of the axioms of probability theory is that the probability of the event omega which is you know a subset of omega um, this has to be always one and that kind of I hope makes sense that we as uh, kind of require this as an axiom for a probability measure because omega is the space of all states of the world so the world is always in a state in this omega so it should have probability one that this event occurs and then part of the properties of a sigma algebra on omega is that this full set omega is actually part of that sigma algebra so that we can do so that this statement is even meaningful uh, next statement is kind of the opposite extreme that's the probability of the empty set which means that the world is in some state omega from the empty set that obviously has to be zero and again then the property another property of the sigma algebra is that the empty set is actually part of that sigma algebra and then finally the last property that we require from the probability measure is um, kind of the more interesting property that is if you have a union of events and it could even be a countably infinite union um, then the probability of this union has to be the same as the sum of the probabilities provided that um, all of these events EI are pairwise disjoint and that just means that there's no state omega that appears in more than one of uh, these events um, so this is also kind of intuitive if you have events that um, were that exclude each other where it can never be the case that more than one of these events occurs then the probability of their union should be the sum of the probabilities and just you know this uh, as a quick remark so from these two you can follow immediately uh, that also if you have the union kind of the more typical case of just a um, a finite union i equals 1 to k ei uh, then that is also the sum of these event these probabilities um, provided that they are pairwise disjoint simply because you can always extend this finite union to an infinite union by extending it with a lot of empty sets which will trivially be disjoint with everything else and they have probability zero so they drop out of this sum so that's not an additional requirement that it immediately follows so with that we've kind of defined how probability me uh, probability measure works and um, it may seem kind of odd at first why we define probabilities only on the subsets and not not directly on the states omega of the world like this a single state of the world why don't we just say each state of the world happens with some certain probability um why do we kind of restrict ourselves to these um to why do we only define it on these subsets um and the reason for that is in some cases it may not make any sense to talk about the probability of a single event and that is always that typically happens if we have a continuous um probability distribution so as a remark So for 
continuous. So for continuous states of the world, um, the probability of a single event for a single doesn't make a lot of sense. Typically, uh, doesn't make much sense. Um, so why is that the case? Well, think of an example. Let's say um, EG. Let's say um, you are modeling um, the arrival time of a bus. So omega is the um, real numbers. You can model times by real numbers and um, it models the, um, so a state of omega, so omega element omega uh, is, so you're modeling the arrival time of a bus. Um, then what is, you can ask yourself the question, what is the probability with what probability? Or oh, let's make model, let's make omega actually just, you know, so that we can, yeah, let's leave it like this. So what is the probability that the bus arrives exactly at 4 p.m. today. Well, that's the probability of the event that only consists of that one number, which would be kind of 4 p.m. today. And then you have to translate that somehow into real numbers, maybe using Number, number of seconds since the Unix epoch or something like this, right? So uh, expressed as a real number um, according to some standard. So what is that probability? And well, you can easily convince yourself that that probability should really be zero. Um, and it should not be zero just for 4 p.m., but it should really be zero for any time. Why is that the case? Well, you can kind of draw the, um, the spectrum of arrival of possible arrival times. So T here, or which would be the omega, um, somewhere on the spectrum, you have the time 4 p.m. But you have kind of a continuum of times around this. And now if you assigned some positive value to this, some positive probability to this specific time, then, I mean, you should also probably assign some positive value to the time 4 p.m plus one second. And it should probably be pretty much the same probability because I mean, whether the, the bus arrives at 4 p.m. or one second late, it should probably be pretty much the same probability. And then, but then you can kind of, uh, uh, kind of go even finer. Then you can say, okay, what about this time, which is uh, 4 p.m. plus half a second. Well, it should probably also be pretty much the same probability. It should probably even be kind of somewhere in between these two probabilities.
And then you could continue this process and you could really find an infinite number of time steps in between here. And if you want to be consistent, you have to assign to them some probability that's very close to these probabilities at the ends. So unless these probabilities are all zero, at some point you will run out of probability budget. So you will exceed the total budget of one probability because all these events are obviously disjoint. So they have to sum up in total to one and cannot be uh, sum up to something larger than one. So therefore it doesn't make sense to assign anything other than probability zero to an event that contains only a single point on a um, continuous spectrum. But what we can do, and this is why we defined our probability measure on, on sets and not just on single values. So what we can still do is um, define, for example, a probability of the interval from, let's say, 4 p.m. to um, uh, 4 p.m. plus one second. So that would be this tiny interval here. And even though every single point in here has zero probability, the whole interval, so um, this whole interval um, has kind of this probability then, which um, there's no reason why that has to be zero. So that can, can be larger than zero. And there's no inconsistency here because we only assumed, even though all of these individual probabilities are zero, um, and they are all disjoint, but we assumed, if I may scroll up, only that the sum sums up to the union only if the union is countable. And this interval is certainly not a countable set. It's a continuous uh, interval on the real axis. All right, so this is just kind of to explain why we introduce probabilities on sets, so on events which are subsets of the space and not just on single um, single events, oh, sorry, sing single items uh, from the sample space. And the reason is because for continuous um, spaces, we really need to think about always kind of um, extended regions in the space. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense. But we, for all intents and purposes, in this course, we will always think about um, probability. Uh, when we, whenever we think about continuous probabilities, we will always think about probabilities that admit what's called a probability density. And I will come to that in a second. And with this probability density, you can assign some value, which is not a probability, but a probability density to individual events. And that will make things much easier in these case, cases. I'll come to that, that in a second when I define expectation values. So after this kind of brief remark, um, let's go back. So we defined our probability measure. And with this probability measure, we can measure the probabilities of um, subsets of events, so of subsets of um, our uh, sample space. And now I told you that in order to, to so our really old goal was to um, uh, quantify correlations um, between parts of our message. And in order to do this, we will have to introduce random variables. So we have to treat our message as a uh, kind of uh, sequence of random variables. Um, so let me define what a random variable is. So a random variable, uh, mathematically the definition is very simple. It's just a function and I'm going to note random variables with capital letters from kind of the end of the alphabet, so X, Y, Z. And um, mathematically they are just functions from the sample space omega to some space that um, is kind of takes the values of the random variables. So for example, it could be a real valued random variable then it's a function from omega to the real values. Um, and that's really all a random variable is, but what do we mean with that when we uh, talk about a random variable? And I think that's, again, best understood at an example. So let's consider an example. And if you have missed it, here it is back. It, let's 
think again about our simplified game of Monopoly. Right? And if you uh, kind of join this uh, series of videos late, or if you've forgotten what this means, it's actually very simple. Um, you have two dice and you throw them and you're mostly interested kind of in the sum of the dice. Um, so the sample space is just uh, the space of pairs A and B. And let's assume um, so that we can talk about them. Let's just assume that the first that the dice have different colors. So A is then the value of the red die. And then B is the value of the blue die, blue as in B, or B as in blue. Blue die. Um, and also for simplicity, so that we um, don't have to um, write out huge tables, uh, we assume that these are not standard six sided dice, but instead they are fair three sided dice. So A and B can only take values from one, two, and three. Then in order to define, uh, let's go through all the steps of defining a probability measure. So in order to define that we need a sigma algebra, which is a set of subsets of the sample space. And for discrete random variables, there's really no reason not to make the sigma algebra just the set of all subsets, which is also called the power set. So P of omega, sometimes denoted as this, but actually since uh, P is already used this mu uh, so much, um, I'm actually um, kind of, uh, I'm going to avoid this notation. I'm just going to write it as two to the power of omega, which is also a common notation. So this is just um, the set of all subsets of omega. So in particular includes um, omega itself and also the empty set as it has to uh, for a sigma algebra. And then what's the probability of any of these events? Well, we assume that these are fair-sided dice, so um, all combinations should really, um, individual combinations should really appear with the uh, same probability. So we can say that the probability of some event, which is a subset of the sample space, is just uh, the number of different states in that event divided by the number of states in our sample space, which is nine. So this is the number of size of set E divided by nine. And now we can define some random variables. So the obvious random variables that we might want to define are um, random variables. The obvious ones are uh, certainly kind of the value of this values of the two dice. So the value of the red die, I'm going to call this X sub R for red. Um, and so as a reminder, so random variables are functions from the sample space to, well, in our case, even a subset just of the real values, but we can treat it as a real value. Um, so it takes a random variable as a, a, a sample from our sample space, which is always a pair A and B. So let's just write this out. What is this? So it takes A and B. And then in this case, it will project on the value of the red die, which was this value A here. So it is just that maps it to A, which is a real number. It's even a, just an integer from one, two, or three. And then obviously we can also define another random variable, um, which is the value of the blue die. And that X sub B takes also A and B and maps them to B. And so far we haven't really gained anything from defining these random variables. We could have just thought of A and B uh, from the start with. But um, another random variable that we're actually more interested in in this simplified game of Monopoly is really uh, the total value of the throw. So the sum of red plus blue die. I'm going to denote this random variable as X sub S for sum again takes a some value from the sample space and then it maps it to a plus b which is now you know, in the set two three 
four, five, or six. And with these random variables, we can already uh, kind of think about some properties of these random variables. And we can think of properties of any single random variable. But then importantly, we can also think about how these two interact. And we will see that, for example, these first two kind of, they are what we will then define as independent, statistically independent. But the third one will then no longer be independent with any of the previous ones. Uh, so let's uh, think about that. So um, let's first cover the easy part. That will be properties of single random variables. Or of a single random variable. And here the most important property that we will define is the expectation value. Um, and I'm going to define it here mainly for a discrete random variable of a discrete. So one where the set of values that it can take only um, takes a discrete set and uh, for simplicity we'll also assume that the sample space is discrete. Um, So the expectation value of p of x, of some random variable x, is just, um, as we are used to it, kind of the sum of all the states in the sample space, probability of the state that only contains that sample times the value of the random variable. So it's a weighted average, right? Because uh, these ones add up to one. Um, so this is a weighted average of the values that the, uh, that the random variable can take. Um, this is assuming that the probability is really defined on all of these single value um, um, events, single um, state events. Um, Another way you can define an equivalent way you can define the expectation value of a random variable is that you say you sum over all the values that the random variable can take. So those are all the, uh, let's call them x, lowercase x in, so all the values that, so um, if I evaluate a random variable on all samples from the sample space, I get a set of values that the random variable can take and I'm going to sum over all of them. And then I'm going to take um, that value. Let me write it at the end to be consistent with the previous one. And then weight it by the probability of kind of all, you know, the event that includes all uh, the states that would lead to this value. So you can write that as kind of inverse of this random variable. So the function that now maps back from these values, uh, like these, these, or these, maps back um, to um, the set of, um, to a subset in of the sample space. So this would be then x inverse of little x. So this is an event. Um, here, this x inverse of little x is um, the set of all omega such in the sample space such that x of omega equals x. And if you define it like this, then you don't have to assume that uh, the probability to measure is defined on all these single value events. It only has to be defined on these kind of um, um, invert on these events that uh, lead to a consistent value of the random variable. And you can convince yourself using the axioms of the probability measure that these two definitions are equivalent if the probability measure is defined on both of these uh, types of events. The, the reason why I went 
through this in such detail is now um, if you think about kind of um, expectation values of um, of continuous random variables expectation values value of a continuous random variable So something like a real valued random variable, like not integer valued, really real valued random variable, continuous um, random variable. Um, then the way this is defined, in order to define this, you need to introduce um, um, a, prob um, a measure theory. And I'm not going to go into the details, I'm just kind of write on how it is defined. So um, expectation of P under of some X is then kind of formally defined as the integral of um, x of omega under what's called the integration measure um, of dp omega. So this is called the integration measure. So again, I'm not going to go into the details how that is defined. Um, but um, it is kind of, and intuitively it's kind of based on this form of the expectation value and then you make these sets, um, you kind of allow um, values to be slightly, you know, um, to, to differ slightly and then you make this um, interval on which you allow values smaller and smaller and you detect that limit. Um, so if you're more interested in that, I encourage you to take a course or read a book on uh, measure theory. But for all intents and purposes, in the, for all the continuous valued um, random variables in this lecture, so in this lecture, in this course, we will always assume that we have um, random variables that admit some uh, what's called a, a density function, a probability density function. And then this integral would just be the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity, kind of the usual Riemann integral that you might be used to of um, x. And then um, I'm going to call this lowercase p of x um, dx, so this is just the regular int uh, integral, and this function p of x is called a uh, probability density function, which has this property that p of x is non-negative for all x, but it can be larger than one, and that is important to remember. But Uh, actually, the other property is also that um, the integral of p of x itself, dx, is 1 from the negative infinity to infinity, but at any individual point, p of x can be larger than 1. Can be larger than 1. Um, I'm not going to go much more into detail here for uh, real values. We will discuss this more once we actually um, arrive at real valued random variables, but it's important to keep in mind that these probabilities densities can be larger than one because um, they are only kind of densities normalized by the size of some small interval, the size of this dx essentially. So with that, let me first, before we move on, actually give you an example of an expectation value now for uh, discrete random variables, because that's kind of the easier case to think about. So again, here the expectation, let's just think about the expectation value of, um, for example, our the throw of our red die, which will be the same, obviously, of the expectation value of the throw of the blue die, simply because, you know, they are identical dyes, they just happen to have different colors. So their expectation value is, you know, 
um, if you follow either of these sums, you should find that this is two because you get the numbers one, two, and three with equal probability. So in on average, you get two. And then the expectation value of um, the sum uh, should be four if you do the math. So this was the definition of the expectation value for both kind of discrete random variables and continuous random variables. And again, this is a property of a single random variable. Let's now make a final um, definition for a single random variable, and then we move we will move over to definitions for multiple random variables, and that's where it will become interesting because then we can define what we mean by correlations. So the final definition for um, property of a single random variable is just its kind of probability distribution. So probability distribution of a single random of a random variable. And this is more kind of just to fix a notation. So what I mean, I will introduce two notations here. One will be kind of the probability of x equals some lowercase x, I will always denote with lowercase the values of a random variable and with uppercase the actual random variables. And that is just the probability of the event that includes all symbols from the sam uh, samples from the sample space uh, where random variable takes that value. So as you would probably expect it to be. And then importantly, another definition, a, a shortcut that will be used a lot is if you just write P of X, and this is also standard kind of notation in the literature, what you mean with that, that is the function that maps um, this little X to this value on the right hand side. So it's a function um, from, for example, the real values, if you have a real value random variable to, um, probability space, uh, which maps x to um, p of x equals x. So it's the function, you can think of it as um, the function um, p of x equals dot. So p of x equals the argument of that function. So don't get confused if you see kind of this notation, just P of some random variable without any value that's then considered as a function that takes an argument and maps it to the probability. Okay, so we've introduced properties of single random variables that were the expectation value and the probability distribution of that random variable. Now let's get to the more interesting part, which is properties of multiple random variables. And we'll start with properties of two random variables. So, which covers most of what we want to discuss, um, but there will be one um, additional concept that will require us to think of three random variables. First properties of two random variables. Uh, and here we will really see how random variables interact and that will allow us to define what we mean with, with correlations. So first thing is kind of a generalization of this probability distribution. And if you think about two random variables, you can directly generalize this to what's called the joint distribution. And the main reason why I introduced this is because I want to introduce the name joint because that will come up a lot. So the joint probability distribution of let's say two random variables X and Y um, is denoted as P of X equals X comma Y equals Y. And that is as you would expect just the probability of the event of all states in the sample space um, that satisfy the property that both um, x takes the value 
lowercase x and y takes the value, the random variable y takes the value lowercase y. And then similarly, if you just write p of x comma y capital X comma capital Y, that is a function from kind of, for example, if they are both real valued random variables r cross r to the interval from zero to one, um, which maps x comma y lowercase so values to um, this um, joint probability distribution. So nothing unexpected here, just fixing the notation. But then we wanted to define what does it mean to look at correlations. So let's think about what does it not mean. So, so far we've always considered messages where uh, the symbols, each symbol kind of follows an its individual probability distribution. We said that these could be different, that doesn't really change much of the picture, but uh, they shouldn't depend so far on other symbols that we've seen so far or that we might see afterwards. And if whenever you have something like this, then that's these kind of random variables are called statistically independent. So let me phrase that as a definition. That is an important definition. Um, two random variables x and y are said to be statistically independent or just independent if you want to be kind of brief precisely if um, the joint probability distribution p of x equals x, or let me write it in brief first and then kind of extend what that means. So p of x comma y equals p of x times p of y. So what does that mean? I.e. p of x equals x. So this is an equality between functions. So it means that p of x comma equals x comma y equals y is equal to that they, these functions are pointwise equal. So p of x equals x times p of y equals y for all x comma y. So this is a very important definition to random variables are statistically independent if the joint distribution is the product of what's called the marginal distributions. These are called, and you will see on the problem set why they are called marginal distributions, because if you write a table of these distributions, then those will kind of naturally, a natural place to put these probabilities as at the margin of that table. So let's look at some of our examples and see if they are independent or not and whether that matches kind of our intuition. So uh, let's um, go back to our kind of examples of the simplified game of Monopoly. So um, and you can easily convince yourself that uh, the red throw and the, the value of the red die and the value of the blue die that they are independent. And that kind of matches our intuition, but you can also verify it explicitly by literally just verifying that this equation holds for all x and y going from one, two, and three in all combinations. Um, but now if you look at x red and x um, sum, or you could equivalently also look at x blue and x sum, and you will find that these two are not independent. They are not independent. 
which is kind of a double negative, but it's the usual way how this is expressed. Um, and the way to prove this is that you find you only have to find a single example where this equation is violated. So, for example, so for example, um, if you take um, p of x red equals one and x sum equals three. Well, what is that probability? Well, it's a probability of that contains, you know, the event that contains all the states now where both of these are satisfied. Well, in order to satisfy both of them, clearly the red row has to be one. And then if the red row is one and the sum of them is three, then the blue row, the blue die has to have value two. So it's the probability of that single event, which we said is now has probability one over nine, because it has only one event and the probability was always number of event, number of samples, um, number of states divided by nine. Um, so that's uh, the left-hand side here, but then the right-hand side is, but P of X red equals one times P of x sum equals three. What is that? Well, that is x red equals one has probability one third. It's a fair, a fair die. Uh, times the probability of the sum equals three. Well, that's the probability um, of all the events that give a sum of equal three, which are the events one comma two, as well as two comma one. So that has value um, two over nine, sorry, two, yes, uh, two over nine. Uh, so in total, uh, the probability will be two over, um, 27, which is not equal to one over nine. So the two are not, so this equation is not satisfied. It's violated for some examples. So they are not statistically independent. And that's what we kind of also expect because once we know, once somebody tells us, so how can we think about them being not independent? Well, if somebody tells us, if we don't know the value of the red row, then we kind of know that, um, Kind of know a probability distribution of the sum. But once somebody tells us that the red row has, for example, value one, then we know that the sum is somewhat, then is probably lower. So it's probably a low value. So we learn by learning the value of the red row, we learn something at least statistically about the value of the sum. And that actually directly leads us to uh, the next definition is that is, you know, how does a probability distribution change once we know the probability distribution of some random variable? How does that change once we know a different random variable? And that is called the conditional probability. So, um, additional T distribution. And that is an important definition. So um, we can either kind of define it um, for events. And what I am going to write out how this is pronounced. So we're talking about the conditional probability of event E2 given event E1. That is notated as P of E2 with a bar which is pronounced as given E1. 
So what is this probability? Um, well, it's the probability that um, both of these events happen. So if both of these events happen, then we know that the world is some, in some state that appears in both of these events. So it must be in some state from the union of these events. Um, but if we already know that event E is happening anyway, then we have to normalize by the probability of the event E1. So therefore, one way to make sense of, I mean, it is a definition, so it could be anything, but uh, one way to make sense of why this is uh, defined in this way is, so therefore, if you think about P of um, not E2, given E1, that is then the probability of P of e, E2 without the event E1 divided by the probability of E1 according to this definition. And therefore, if you add the two up, you can convince yourself that probability of E2 given E1 uh, plus the probability of not E2 given E1. So not E2 is really just not E2 is really just omega without E2. Um, that that is one, as you would kind of kind of expect from a sensible definition. That um, if you add up, if you already know that event E one happens, and then you want to add up the definitions that, given that E one happens, either event E two happens or it doesn't happen, the sum of those has to be exactly one. And it, as an exercise, you may want to kind of prove this relation using only the um, the axioms of the probability measure. So this is an important uh, definition of the conditional probability, and I kind of tried to motivate why this definition makes sense. Um, in practice, we will not deal that much with individual events. We will think more about random variables, but you can immediately then see how would it translate to random variables. So conditional probabilities for random variables um, is P of X2 um, given X1 is um, probability of X2 comma or X1 comma X2, probably easier to read. Uh, divided the probability of x1. So again, what does this mean? This is an equality between functions, so it really just means that p of x2 or equals little x2, or let me actually call them x and y, so it's less confusing because we used x and y before. So p of y given x is the probability of x and y divided by the probability of y. And this is just a shorthand notation of saying uh, p of y equals little y given p of x equals little x is the probability, the joint probability of x equals x comma y equals y divided by p of y equals y. Again, it's pretty much the same definition, but kind of important. So let me just, because it's so important, write out, so how do we interpret this? And I kind of try to 
motivate this interpretation with this calculation. So the way we interpret this is we say, um, what is the probability of y being taking value lowercase y if I already know know that uh, some other random variable x um, as value lowercase x. So how can you answer this question? Well, it's given by this definition. But one thing you can immediately answer is, well, if x and y are independent or statistically independent, then we know that by definition of statistical independence, p of x comma y is the product of p of x, p of y, and therefore this conditional probability p of y given x, which is the joint divided by the marginal, which is now 4, and this is important, this is only um, if you have independent random variables. Then it's the product of p of x times p of y divided by p of x. So then it's just p of y. So that is if they are independent. But if they are not independent, then this is and then we know that this is not the case. Now I want to clear up before I move on uh, one common source of confusion. So when I say that what is the probability of y having some value y if I already know that x has some value x. A lot of times when people read this they think that okay then x has to happen first kind of has to you know be set first. Uh, let's say let's think about this game of Monopoly where we have two dice so x is one of the dice so first I have to throw these dice and then I can take their sum right because it kind of sounds like this this is the cause and then this is the effect. Uh, but this is really important to keep in mind that that's not true. So um, uh, let me make that as an important remark. And it is important because we will actually encounter the opposite of that fairly, fairly often in the rest of the course. So um, just because I can write, so writing um, p of y given x does not imply any causality. I.e. it does not mean that um, x is the cause of y or that y is the effect of x. So really you can define, this is just, you know, defined by this ratio and you can define this ratio anytime. In particular, you can even, even if you know that, even if that should be the case that y is the effect of x, then you can always um, invert this relation. So even if 
x is the cos of y, we can still calculate the opposite, which is p of x given y. So for example, in our simplified game of Monopoly, we could say, oh, now we know, let's say somebody tells us that the sum of the two throws y is some certain value, is maybe 6. And then from that we know, oh, therefore both of the, uh, both of the dice have to be 3, because that's the only way you get to 6. Somebody could tell us that the sum is 5, and then we know, oh, with probability 1 half, um, each uh, die takes the value 3, and with the other half it takes the value 2. And with probability 0, they take the value 1, because that couldn't lead us to the sum of 5. So we can always calculate this, which is then, I mean, given as always as probability of x comma y divided by y. And explicitly the way how we would calculate this is then if somebody gives us this thing is we would um, now uh, use this definition and kind of invert it, bring this part to the left hand side. And this is called the chain rule of probability. So we can write this always as um, p of x times p of y given x. And then in order to get to this part, well, what you have to do is we have to also look at this joint, which is p of x, p of sorry, y given x. And we have to actually evaluate it at values for x and sum over all these values. Actually, let me call this x prime so there's no confusion. And that's what's called Bayesian inference. And this is, I mean, this was just very briefly. I mean, if you haven't been able to follow this part, um, we'll go kind of more into detail how you actually do Bayesian inference in practice later. But I think this is a good point to first introduce you to this idea that even if you have some causal relationship, that even if, if x is the cause of y and y is the effect of x, you can always kind of principle at least calculate what's called the posterior distribution, um, which kind of inverts this causal relationship. So this is called Bayesian inference. All right, one last remark about these uh, conditional probabilities um, and then we uh, briefly uh, look at um, a way how you can, a first way how you can actually use all these concepts to model complicated probability distributions for uh, compression methods. So um, the final remark is actually what I already did kind of in the step from here to here is just another way of writing um, the condition, the definition of the conditional probability, and that is called the chain rule. So, chain rule of uh, probability theory. And that really, it just follows directly, directly, right, can't write anymore. Um, from the definition of conditional probabilities. And this chain rule tells you that whenever you have a um, joint probability p of x comma y, you can always write this as um, p of x times p of y given x. And again, to verify this, just insert the definition of the conditional probability and it will directly uh, fall out. Um, but also, as I said, you can always kind of also write out the opposite kind of direction, 
of the conditional probability. So we can also always write this as p of y times p of x given y. And then if you have um, three probabilities, so three random variables, p of x, y, z, you can, for example, always write this as p of x times p of y given x times p of um, z given x comma y and it should be clear now how uh, this part is defined which conditions on both of them you just divide by the joint distribution of x and y you take the joint of x y and z and divide by the joint of x and y and then you can there are again it's like other like all permutations all three possible permutations here are valid um, this is called the chain rule of probabilities. So the reason why I introduced this is because now we can take a step back and kind of go back to um, compression. So let's conclude this interlude. So here we come back now to compression. Back to compression. Source coding. So, and in particular, on problem set, on the problem set three, I want to really advertise this problem because I think it's a very um, instructive thing to actually walk, th walk through this problem. There's a coding exercise where you will implement your first, or if you've already done it, you've implemented your first really deep learning based compression method for, and this will be a compression method, lossless compression method for a natural language text. And you will see that with very simple tools, you can already implement something that in kind of a niche application for just certain types of English texts, this method will be able to outperform anything that you um, kind of can use off the shelf, um, any compression measure method that you may have used before. And so, so in problem, uh, what is the problem 3.2, you will implement and I really encourage you to do this because it should be a very simple problem actually because most of the code is already given, the, the model is already implemented, but I'm kind of I left some, just some really critical steps out where you have to fill in kind of how you then, then use this model for compression. So you'll implement a compression method, method for natural language. Just written natural language. And it will actually be very uh, quite performant, even though it's kind of a very simplistic model. But it will already, in order to achieve this performance, um, it will already exploit correlations between. So it will use a probabilistic model that explicitly models correlations between characters in um, your message. It will exploit correlations and I should have maybe noticed this so correlations so whenever we've defined what an independent random variables are if two random variables are not independent then we say they are correlated Uh, symbols, where the symbols in this model are characters. So how does this model do this? Well, this model, so in order to exploit these correlations, you have to have a probabilistic model that can capture these correlations. So it cannot be one of these simplistic models that we've used so far. Instead, it will be a model that kind of uses this chain rule. So the model 
is, you know, the message is, will be some, um, and I'm now going to model kind of the message in general as a random variable, x underlined, which is some sequence of sequence of random variables. up to some length k. And it will be given as, um, so, so then the model of this message will be a probability distribution, will kind of assign a probability to every message. And the way it, it does this is um, kind of using this chain rule. So using the chain rule by saying, okay, this I can always write this as p of x1, p of x2 given x1, p of x3 given x1, x2, and so on, until p of xk given x1, x2 up to xk minus one. So this is always possible. In principle, so this is always correct for any model. But now we kind of see the fundamental trade-off that we'll have to do a lot now in this lecture is that if you actually want to do this, you can see that these probability distributions that become more and more complicated, right? So this is now a function that takes three arguments, the value of the symbol x3, the value of the symbol x1, and the value of the symbol x2. And then for the last symbol, it will be a function that takes a lot of arguments. So um, uh, you somehow have to uh, restrict these arguments. Um, so the issue that we have here, um, this is not the general, like while this is possible in general, um, we cannot um, actually do this in practice. So um, this, this general exactly correct. Um, uh, factorization, factorization of the model. Sage of the joint distribution. Um, it's not, um, computationally feasible. So this last probability, for example, uh, P of XK X1 conditioned on x1, x2, up to all these xk minus one um, is an extremely, like in, in general, is would have to be an extremely complicated function. And what you do in this exercise, I mean, the model is kind of given already, but you will see kind of one trick to do this. And all these tricks, um, we will see many ways to kind of then construct models that can still capture important correlations, um, but that are still compact. So um, we need um, ways to, on the one hand, capture relevant correlations 
uh, while still um, remaining kind of a model that can be um, stored in a compact form and then also evaluated computationally efficient. So while maintaining compact storage packed model representation. So what I mean with that is just if we actually save this model on a computer, it has to, it shouldn't take up gigabytes of our RAM. And um, we also have to be able to um, be able to evaluate these probability distributions in an efficient way. So computational So we need kind of general ways to do this. And that will kind of be a lot of the goal of the next parts of the lecture. And kind of the general strategy for that is to enforce conditional independence. And this is now a property. Uh, what is conditional independence? This is now a property of three random variables. So um, what does this mean? For x, so random variables x, y, and c, we have that um, y and z are conditionally independent, so this is a definition, are conditionally independent given x um, if, precisely if, um, the probability distribution, and now this is kind of very similar to the definition of um, conditional um, uh, of, of, of standard independence, but I'm going to write it in a kind of a slightly different way. So um, the way to think about this, the most natural way to think about this is to say that um, if P of C given X and Y is uh, the same as P of C given X. So knowing y, if you already know x, then knowing y doesn't help us, doesn't give us any additional information about the probability z. And as an exercise, you may prove that this is equivalent to um, one form that makes it more similar to a definition of independence is you can also write this as saying that P of Y given X, sorry, P of Y and C given X is the same as P of Y given X times P of C given X. So you will recognize this is very similar, looks very similar to the definition of regular independence of y and c, it's just the joint of y and c is the product of y, probability of y and probability of c, just that everything is conditioned on x. So, but for the context that we're interested in, I mean, these two are equivalent. Um, this formulation is actually kind of easier to think about because you can now go back into this model where we um, decompose our probability distribution as this chain. And it probably makes sense to write 
to kind of write this in a more compact pictorial notation. So the way we've um, looked at this in the general setup, the chain rule, is that we said we have these random variables x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on until xk. And I'm going to notate them as kind of circles. And the way we decompose this probability over all these is that we said we had you know, one probability of x1, and then, so p of x1, and then we take that times some probability of x2. So left-hand side, we have uh, p of all the x's. So we take the times the probability of x2 um, conditioned on x1. And the way we notate this is we introduce an arrow here that points from the thing that we're conditioning on to the thing that we're modeling. And then times, again, the probability of x3 conditioned on both x1 and x2. So pictorially, you can depict this as introducing these two errors. And then in the next step, um, we introduced yet another dependence. So we so then times probability of x4 given x1, x2, x3. So that kind of introduces this arrow, this arrow, and this arrow. Right, and then this goes on. And now you can ask yourself, well, are all these dependencies really always necessary? And, you know, not thinking about natural language for a second, I mean, you could, for example, say, well, um, maybe you know that there is, that X3 actually, that this process that transitions from X1 to X2 to X3, maybe you know that this follows some process that actually doesn't have any memory. So if that is the case, then you get to our first kind of simplified model. So I will now introduce three different ways to simplify this, three um, possible simplifications. And this will be kind of a general theme that you have to now think about, you know, what do you actually expect in your in your data set, then you have to model it, and then you have to measure by evaluating, you know, the cross entropy between, or like estimating the cross entropy between some data set and your model, whether your assumptions were actually good. But something you can now think about is, you know, once you have a data set, you can assume, for example, what happens if um, A, if there is no memory, So the process, yeah, the, if, you know, x, i are generated, are actually generated in sequence, and this generating process um, has no memory. This will certainly not be a good model for natural language, but for many physical processes, this is certainly a good model. And then what you talk about is a Markov process. Actually, let me capitalize it. It's a technical term. So a Markov process assumes assumes conditional independence of x i and all x j 
with j less than i minus 1 given xi minus 1. So what does this mean? It assumes that all of these links that jump more than one by a distance more than one that they don't exist. So what that means is that you can now draw a model that has the following form it has only these connections these direct connections So the joint probability of that model is just the product of i equals 1 to k p of xi given xi minus 1. Where for the first step we're just saying if you're conditioning x0, x0 doesn't exist. So that's just then the marginal distribution of x1. So that might be a good model for um, processes that are memoryless, but for natural language, that's certainly not a good model. So for natural language, if you model it by characters, there are certainly like dependencies. Even if you know this letter, um, you can even maybe knowing this letter may give you some hint about what the next letter is. But if you knew also the past letters before that, that will certainly help you to predict this next letter. That it will remove some ambiguity about the next one. But uh, you can now take this Markov process and kind of make it successively kind of more complicated. So the next kind of way to model things would be by what's called a hidden Markov model. And that has the following form here. You say, okay, maybe um, there is some memory less process, but it doesn't operate on the things that I directly observe. Instead, it that memory less process operates on some other random variables. I'm going to call them H for hidden. So this is still assumed to be memoryless, but then what you actually observe is some um, symbols that can are only kind of a a result of the, you don't observe the whole hidden state. You only observe some result that could even be kind of a stochastic uh, function of. Um, of, of um, the hidden state. So just knowing the hidden state doesn't tell you, so knowing the symbols that you observe doesn't tell you, that tells you something about the hidden state, but not everything about that. And as an exercise, again, you should convince yourself that um, by constructing maybe a little small example, so exercise, Uh, you should convince yourself that this can actually capture capture long range correlations. What do I mean with that in a second? So what I mean with that in a model like this, Um, let's say um, x1 and x3 do not have to be be conditionally independent given x2. So knowing this thing in between 
um, doesn't tell you everything about that you could know about x3. Actually, if you know x2 and x1, it tells you more, could tell you more about x3 than just knowing about x2 alone. And this is different from these Markov models where knowing x2 tells you everything you could know about x3. Knowing an additional x1 doesn't help you because that only explains, you know, where x2 came from, but it doesn't then help you anything further to understand where x3 came from. And this is different in these hidden Markov models. But now these hidden Markov models are actually a bit difficult for compression. So they are very popular models and very important models. That's why I wanted to introduce them, but they are difficult for compression. Uh, for compression. Because you now, in order to encode something with this model, you would have to probably transmit these hidden states, right? Because um, in order for the decoder to follow these steps, we would have to, um, th these are in a hidden Markov model, these are stochastic processes, so they're not deterministic, non-deterministic. Um, and then, so in order to be able to reconstruct a message on the decoder side, you'd have to um, transmit, kind of encode these hidden states um, using some symbols. And then this step is typically also non-deterministic. So you'd also have to transmit this and you actually have to transmit some more data. And we will discuss a method for this in an upcoming lecture, which will be called bit spec coding. So this is possible, but it's kind of a bit difficult. But there is a kind of third option, and this is the one that you um, follow in the problem set, and that is that of an, what's called an autoregressive model. So an autoregressive model is somewhat similar to a uh, hidden Markov model. So let me actually copy um, parts of this. But what you now have in, a, a hit, in an autoregressive model, you have two You, you deviate from a uh, hidden Markov model in two ways. First, these steps for the hidden states actually become deterministic now. And that means a decoder that wants to follow along, it only has to have, know kind of the initial state, which is could be you know, fixed in a probabilistic model, so that could be part of your model, and that it could kind of follow these deterministic um, transitions, these will still be non-deterministic. But now if you make this deterministic, then it's not really a very powerful model anymore, right? Because then these states are always the same for all, regardless of the message that is encoded. So um, you can't really do much with that. I mean, all you will get out of that is that the probability distribution for each symbol will be um, will follow a different distribution, but they will still be independent. So they will actually be completely uncorrelated. These symbols will now in such a model be independent from each other. But what you do now in an autoregressive model, you additionally, so this is the new part. This is the first new part, um, that this part is deterministic. But then the second new part is also that you then condition the hidden states also on the symbols that you produce. And always on the previous symbol. So this transition, it is still a deterministic transition from the symbol. Um, so this connection is also deterministic. So the whole transition, so the function what I mean with that is h2 is 
or h i plus one is a deterministic, so not a stochastic process function of h i and so of the pair h i x i. And then this part is still non-deterministic so that you can model not only a single a message but a whole plethora of messages. And these are very powerful models and actually some of the highest performing methods also for images, highest performing compression methods actually use autoregressive models. And as I've kind of alluded to in the problem set, you will implement a compression method then, that, then you will see how you can use such an autoregressive model to actually kind of character by character compress a message in such a way that the decoder can follow along exactly and really kind of uh, perform each of these steps and then decompress these messages because it can recover, since everything here is deterministic, it can recover all the hidden states and then it has a different model uh, for each of these symbols which will depend on all the past symbols so it can cover um, uh, complicated correlations. So you will implement this in the problem set but you will also already see in the problem set, so I uh, know, nice part about this is it can cover, can capture long range correlations, again mediated by these hidden states. IE X1 and X3 are in general not conditionally independent given well let's actually make it about x2 and x4 um, given x3 so here somewhere here is x4 and then it So that we don't have any boundary effects um, and then it goes on to some hidden state hk which produces a symbol xk um, and it gets kind of its input also from some previous state and this goes to the next state and next next symbol um, so these symbols are not conditionally independent given x3 in general. So knowing if you know this value, you don't know everything about the next hidden state because the next hidden state also depends on this hidden state and you don't know even knowing this value doesn't tell you everything about this hidden state. So um, knowing this value too tells you a little bit more about this hidden state, also not everything but more. So um, knowing both of these tells you more about the next symbol than just knowing this uh, just knowing this one. So it can capture long range correlations, but um, you will already see um, that uh, this is hard to parallelize. And this is more of a practical point. So if you want to now apply this, for example, to images, where you walk through every pixel, that would be on actual real hardware nowadays, this would run extremely slowly because um, the modern hardware is very good at doing the same thing on a lot of data. It's not very good at, it's not very efficient at doing kind of a sequence of things where every next step has to wait until the previous step is finished. Um, so because that would mess with your pipelines and maybe also with your multi-core setups. So this is kind of a downside of this autoregressive method that it, while it can capture very complicated probability distributions, um, it kind of is computationally still in practice not very good. Um, so in the next lecture, we will learn a method that kind of fixes this. Next video.
uh, you will learn about a method that uses what's called latent variable models. which have kind of a structure that looks like this. So you have your symbols, x1, x2, and so on, till xk. And they are now all kind of, they don't generate, can depend on each other in a chain, but instead they all depend on kind of one higher ranked random variable, which is not part of the message. And you will learn kind of about two non-trivial aspects here. One is that if you have something like this, it really can generate correlations between these symbols, even though each symbol is generated kind of by an in independent prob conditional probability that's conditioned on Z. Once you ignore, once you, Z is not part of the message, these actually become um, correlated or can become correlated in the general sense case. Um, so this can um, capture correlations uh, between the xi's. It can be parallelized, obviously. Um, but the difficult part here is now, um, how do you actually compress data with this? It's not so obvious how you uh, transmit data. And for that, um, I'm going to uh, draw this as a neither smiling nor frowning face, but it's kind of something that, you know, um, gives you a lot of headache is just to have to think about it. But once you find out how it works, it's actually kind of a very neat and surprising answer is how do you actually compress, use this for compression? How to use this for compression? And the method that you uh, will learn here is called bit spec coding. So again, I will, would like to really encourage you to do the problems on problem set, um, let me see, problem uh, 3.2. We really um, implement this kind of, the autoregressive model is given for you, but you implement these, um, these the, the, how you actually use this for compression. I will also, I would also really encourage you to do problem set four, which is also in the uh, description, which kind of practice is, so it should be a very simple problem set. I actually got the feedback that it was uh, perceived as very simple, but it really practices a lot of the notation that we introduced for um, probability theory. And it introduces some uh, new concepts for uh, conditional entropies and things like that. And that will then become important in order to understand how this bit spec coding mechanism works. And I hope I see you in the next video where we will uh, go over the bit spec method. With that, have fun with the problems.